told me that he'd read my paperwork. He didn't say make any comments on it. Um, but but uh, uh, I told him that I had a problem with the terms of bail because I wanted to go to Vancouver and see my wife and, and stay there. And uh, they were making me report at Stetler every Friday, right? And so uh, uh, he says to the Crown, he says, do you have a problem changing the terms of bail? And the Crown said, uh, yes, uh, we have a problem with them leaving the jurisdiction, which is interesting. Okay. Anyways, um, so, so then I, and so then he says, he says, the only thing you can do is you can file an application in Queen's Bench. So he told me two things there, okay? He told me, first of all, he said, I'm not fair and unbiased. I'm working for the Crown. And the Crown wants to do this, and so this is what we have to do. He said, the only way you can override what the Crown wants to do is you got to go to Queen's Bench, which is a real court of general jurisdiction. And we're going to talk about that, okay? And there's court cases that talk about how judges that are statutory administrators are not judges anymore, they're just administrators, okay? You have to understand what's going on. This is in provincial <clears throat> court, okay? So anytime you're in provincial court, it's an administrative hearing based on a statute, and there's no justice going to go on here. It's nothing more than a commercial <laughs> transaction. If you want some justice, you got to bring an action into Queen's Bench. And, and actually, I was doing some research, and there's actually a common law writ called a writ of prohibition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring an action, and that's why I need some money. I need some people to help me out to, uh, um, um, to bring this action in Queen's Bench. Um, um, uh, it'll be a petition for a writ of prohibition, is what it'll be. And, uh, uh, to, uh, to, and what a writ of prohibition does is it prohibits them from proceeding. It's exactly what it does. It's a common law writ. Anyways, so that's, that's where, I was, where I'm planning on going with it. And uh, so uh, uh, anyways, <coughs> back to where we were going here. Um, the persons declared to be citizens are all persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. The evident, evident meaning of these last words is not merely subject in some respect or degree to the jurisdiction of the United States, but completely subject. Okay? So, um, you can be a Canadian. Okay? Canadians are actually two classes of citizens. And in fact, in Texas, they call themselves, the sovereigns call themselves Texians. Okay? The IAM is important. And most people that don't understand it just call themselves Texans. Well, Texans are statutory entities. Texians are the people. And uh, the IA is important. And uh, so, and so when, when Canada was first formed, we all started calling ourselves Canadians. We understood that. As somebody did, because that's how, how it was termed. You see what I'm saying? And so... Um, uh, uh, the term citizen in the United States is analogous to the term subject in the common law. This is common law that's doing it to us. Okay? Now, you have to understand there's different kinds of common law. Okay? Common law is just uh, court decisions. Okay? It's not statutory decisions. It's the decisions of the courts. Now, so you can have, in the U.S., there's court cases that say there's no common law in the federal government. And that's true. But there is a common law of federal court decisions in the U.S. And, uh, and so I guess what I'm saying is, is that the common law of England is 800 years of jury trial decisions from old England. And, and that's what we want to have access to. And that's why I always specify the common law of England when I, when I want to, because you've got to be specific, you know. Uh, the judges, you know, they're not wanting to do anything for you. They want to help out the crown. And so unless you're very specific about what exactly you want, then, uh, then uh, they'll, gee, you know, I wasn't able to give you what you asked for. You see what I'm saying? And so, so when I do this petition, this application, it's going to be an application for a writ of prohibition, and that's it. And then, and then, and then when that, I get it, then I'm going to file a lawsuit, okay? And, and I think, quite frankly, that, that uh, I don't know, do you guys, anybody here ever get deja vu? Anybody ever get deja vu? You know what they say, the guy that did the future map there, and uh, the, both of those, 
Uh, what they say is that when you dream and sleep sometimes, you time travel. And, uh, and so then when you get deja vu, the reason you have that feeling of having been there before is because you were, was in a dream. And my, uh, uh, my nephew's wife last night said, made the comment that uh, um, it's a way of telling you if you're on path, on the path, for your life's, your destiny, basically. And, uh, and I never thought of it that way, but that's probably true. A at any rate, um, so the point is that, um, let's see, where was I going with this? I was talking about uh, uh, deja vu and, oh, I had a dream and, uh, with, with customs. And uh, uh, what happened is, uh, I don't usually remember my dreams, although I do get deja vu all the time. But I don't usually remember my dreams. But when I do remember them, they come true. And uh, I had this dream that I was going up to the border at Coots. And, uh, and uh, they poked their head out the window. I'm not even there yet, right? They poked their head out the window and they just waved me on through. Eh? <laughs> and I think this is just going to turn out to be the, just the best thing that ever happened, quite frankly. <laughs> I think I'm going to turn it into their worst nightmare, and they're going to not want to talk to me ever again. <laughs> I hope so. I guess we'll see, you know, but, but I think that's what's going to happen. But I, I need help, and, and, uh, and it, it'll be good for everybody, quite frankly, because it, they're, no matter what happens, they're going to be, you know, these people at the border are just thugs, and they need to be slapped. And, uh, and it'll be nicer. They'll treat everybody with a lot more respect, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, which they should be. Anyways, um, so common law a lot of times does this to us, okay? This is, I'm not sure if it's common law of England, but it's certainly common law. And uh, um, it's, it, it could be um, common law of federal court cases. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, citizenship is a term of municipal law, okay? Municipal law is very important. We're going to talk about that when we go through martial law. Citizenship carries with it the idea of connection or identification with the state and a participation in its functions, and as such implies much more than residence. Okay, so now they're talking about citizenship, and they're saying it's not the same as residence. Okay, and uh, um, the unborn are not included in the definition of person as used in the Fourteenth Amendment. Remember, the Fourteenth Amendment was for the slaves, and so this is that Roe v. Wade case that where everybody's killing their babies over now. And, uh, and uh, they're basically saying the slaves can kill their babies. That's essentially what they're saying. And so if you kill your baby, then I guess you're a slave. They have no jurisdiction. Sorry? They, the court, the government, the, the U.S. corporation or Canada, the, they don't have jurisdiction over that infant. Well, that's what they're saying. That's true. Yeah. And they're saying that that infant is not a person. And so, so they're allowing, and this is one of the things I rail on them about. I like to rail on them about all sorts of stuff. But I basically say that, that they intend to commit genocide against the sovereignty. Because if they're not a person, then by definition, they're sovereign. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? So they're committing genocide against the sovereignty, <laughs> against their own sovereignty. They're murderers. And, and what that is really is infanticide. That's common law crime. But uh, anyways, and so they actually, uh, uh, some of the stuff I've done has actually caused them to, uh, to redo statutes eh, in the U.S. And, and so now there's a lot of statutes that are showing up that are talking about uh, infanticide and, and killing, you know, unborn babies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it hasn't really stopped the abortions. Um, but, you know, again, they have to appear to be doing the right thing. And so when I reel on them about that stuff, you know, it does. It's. I, I can tell you that that stuff. It has an effect. There's no doubt about it. You know, and there. It's affecting change, um, uh, and more people need to do it. And that's one of the reasons I do these private information shares because, uh, you know, everybody doing their own thing. You know, when I was in Ontario, and this was like back in the mid '90s, but I was. I lived in in southern Ontario for a while, and uh, working at uh, Bombardier, and. Uh, what happened is they had a, uh, um, there was, I wasn't there during this, but some of the people who were there told me about it. They had photo radar for a period of about three months, and then they canceled the program. 
And a lot of people don't know why they canceled the program, but the reason they canceled the program is because they had 250,000 court cases. And uh, the courts can't handle that. I mean, the whole idea of photo radar is to generate revenue. <laughs> mm -hmm. They just want you to mail in those checks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so they, basically the people said, no, we're not doing photo radar. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter if you're right on point or not. You know, if that many people, the courts can't handle that. <laughs> You know, so they decided, well, maybe we ought to try something else to generate revenue. <laughs> but that's, that's what it's all about, I tell you. Uh, and while the 14th Amendment does not create a national citizenship, it has the effect of making that citizenship paramount and dominant instead of derivative and dependent upon state citizenship. In other words, the two classes of citizens have always existed. Okay, they exist in Canada, they exist everywhere. And it talks about it in the Bible. And so we're going to go into that more. And, but what the 14th Amendment did is it made it paramount and dominant. In other words, before the 14th Amendment, you had to be a state citizen first before you could be a federal citizen. And so then uh, 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 you were the, the federal citizen was just a corporation that you could use to do things that didn't really cause you injury. See what I'm saying? But now you can be a federal citizen without being a state citizen. It changes their presumption. Okay, Their presumptions are changed. And now you have to defeat their presumptions that, that you're one of their slaves. And, and that's, that's what happened, is it changes their presumptions in the courts. Citizenship is a polit political status and may be defined and privilege limited by Congress. The term citizen, resident and citizen of the United States is distinguished from a citizen of one of the several states in that the former is a special class of citizen created by Congress. The 14th Amendment referred to slavery, consequently the only person uh, embraced by its provisions for which Congress was authorized to legislate in the manner were those then in slavery. And this is uh, uh, no white person born within the limits of the United States and subject to their jurisdiction or born without those limits and subject uh, and consequently naturalized <coughs> under their laws owes his status to citizenship of the recent amendments to the federal constitution. Notice, and, and you see this, okay, this is... Uh, uh, in, the, in the real 13th Amendment, it talks about uh, uh, under, under them, okay, it talks about under them as in the United States, or either of them, okay, and that means the states. And so, um, it's, you see that happen, and so the, in this one, you're seeing where um, it talks about um, um, subject, or born, and uh, let's see, subject to their jurisdiction, okay? That's the federal jurisdiction. See what I'm saying? Subject to their jurisdiction, it's federal jurisdiction. Um, anyways, so you see that. It's very subtle in the wording, but you gotta, if once you see it, you, you, you recognize, you know, what it is. All citizens of the United States shall have the same right in every state or territory as enjoyed by white citizens thereof to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, convey, real or personal property. And that's the United States Code. And that's there to this day. You can look it up. 42 United States Code nice. Section 1982. Right? Quite clear. That's what it's all about. Face. Yeah. <laughs> so I tell them. And, and so, but what happens is that if I go into federal court and I tell them I'm one, not one of your low-life scumbag U.S. citizens, they'll dismiss the case. They do it all the time, I tell you. And uh, um, because they don't have jurisdiction over state citizens. They don't. And... Uh, and, and so that's why, you know, and what, what gets me is at the border, I have problems going across the border because they harass me all the time. But um, um, so I have actually got a lawsuit right now in the Court of Appeals in the states over the, over the border, U.S. border. Therefore, U.S. citizens residing in one of the states of the Union are classified as property and franchised to the federal government as an individual entity. It's all corporate. A U.S. citizen upon leaving the District of Columbia becomes involved in interstate commerce as a resident, does not have the common law right to travel as a citizen of one of the several states. <laughs> After the adoption of the 14th Amendment, a bill which became the first Civil Rights Act was introduced in the 39th Congress, a major purpose of which was to secure the recently freed Negroes, all the civil rights are secured to white men, uh, none other than citizens of the United States or within the provisions of the Act. Remember I told you the Civil Rights Act is for federal citizens. Mm -hmm. It's for slaves. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a slave. So I don't talk about any Civil Rights Act. 
I don't have civil rights, I have unalienable rights. Mm -hmm. I don't want your charter, you can put your charter up your rectal orifice. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Subject, one who owes allegiance to a sovereign and is governed by that sovereign's laws. Speaking generally, uh, we may say that the terms subject and citizen are synonymous. Subjects and citizens are alike in those whose relation to a state is personal and not merely territorial, permanent and not merely temporary. This equivalent, <coughs> however, is not absolute. For in the first place, the term subject is commonly limited to monarchical forms of government, while the term citizen is more specifically applicable in the case of republics. <coughs> and yes, that's true. And uh, so, but even citizen can be a slave. Depends on how it's used. Finally, it is to be noticed that the term subject is capable of a different and wider application in which it includes all members of the body politic, whether they're citizens, uh, uh, subjects, uh, or resident aliens. Okay? All such persons are subjects, all being subject to the power of the state and its jurisdiction, and as owing it at least temporarily fidelity and obedience. Okay, that's Black's Law Dictionary. Whoops. Went too far. <laughs> this is taken from the Law of Nations. This is very interesting. <laughs> Residents, as distinguished from citizens, are aliens who are permitted to take up a permanent abode in the country. Being bound to the society by reason of their dwelling in it, they are subject to its laws so long as they remain there. And being protected by it, they must defend it. Remember the draft? Okay. Mm -hmm. Although they do not enjoy all the rights of citizens, um, they have only certain privileges which the law or custom gives them. Permanent residents are those which have been given the right of perpetual residence. They are a sort of citizen of a less privileged character and are subject to the society without enjoying its advantages. Their children succeed to their status. Okay? For the right of perpetual residence given them by the state passes to their children. So. That's why they have all these immigrants coming in, quite frankly. It's because it clouds everything up. And now they don't know who, and that's one of the things I do in my documents is there's a thing called a judicial power citizen. And, uh, and I can show that I have ancestors here that were, war, that were here at Confederation. And so then, then, then um, they can't claim that I'm, or a descendant I'm, of an alien. See what I'm saying? And uh, 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 that's, that's important. Now, that's not to say that people who come here are... Um, uh, uh, what I do in my documents is I prepare the strongest, most powerful case I can. Okay? And, so, and I do the same thing in the States. And so I, I'm actually a judicial power citizen by right of blood in the States as well. But I'm a judicial power citizen by right of blood here, especially because my father's, okay, by right, by, by blood, my father's name is Govro, okay? You probably saw the uh, Glen Winningham House of Fern, and that's true, but I got adopted. My dad died when I was 12 years old, and I got adopted. By blood, my name is Govro. I don't know if you ever heard of Murray Govro. Yeah. Well, he's my brother. <laughs> I was going to ask you. <laughs> and so, uh, anyways, um, so I come from a long line of rabble rousers. Eh? <laughs> Actually, my grandfather, his name was Pierre Richard Govro. He was an editorialist for the Edmonton Journal. And uh, he wrote, if you go into the provincial archives here in Edmonton, you'll find hundreds of newspaper articles that he wrote. And uh, 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 he used to like stir in the pot too. Eh? <laughs> so anyways, I come from a long line of rabble rousers. My ancestors go back before Confederation. So therefore, I'm a judicial power citizen by red blood. Now, that's the most strongest, most powerful way of doing it. But even common law, just, just uh, um, pleading common law, uh, uh, you can still do it, okay? Um, it's just that uh, it, it, if you're going to do the law, I mean, it depends on how well you lay your foundation. And, and that's what my procedure here I'm going to show you is how to lay a foundation to make it so that that uh, it makes it very difficult for the courts to rule against you. And your um, wife is a herbalist, right? My wife? Yeah. She, no, uh, actually it's my brother's wife, Gary. 
Oh. Gary Govro, oh. his wife is a herbalist. Well, she lives in Glen right? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah my brother lives there, too. Hmm. Uh, and, and I've been staying there. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, because, uh, you know, they make me report at the border, or at the at the RCMP for this bail. And... Uh, so is Murray still doing things? No. He's no. kind of discouraged, quite really? frankly, yeah, and you can't blame him. No. You know, there's really, you know, if this room was full of people, you know, that would be one thing, but... Yeah, and I appreciate you guys coming. Don't get me wrong, but uh, right. but uh, it's discouraging, you know, when you get you know half a dozen or ten people show up for something. Yeah. You know, there should be hundreds. You know, That's right. oh, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so he's he's discouraged, yeah. and and he just he he you know it's interesting because uh, since you know my brother, you know that that he he got charged with failing to file. He sent him a Jerry Hart tax return and with a hammer and sickle on it and stuff like that. Eh? Anyways, they charged him with failing to file. This was back in the uh, 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he fought it. He had uh, Doug Christie <coughs> represent him in court. And uh, Doug Christie passed away recently, by the way. No kidding. Yeah. Had cancer. Oh, Anyways, um, he had Doug Christie represent him in court and um, uh, uh, lost. Eventually, it went to the Court of Appeals, I think. I'm not sure if it went to the... I think it did. But anyways, it lost. And they fined him 6000 bucks, I think. Anyways, he told me recently he's never paid the fine. And they haven't come looking for it. And he does whatever he wants on his tax return. Eh? <laughs> and Good they never him. complain. <laughs> Good for him. Good for him. So uh, he's, he, he's, uh, he's got a business up in, in Grand Prairie called The Safety Guy. And he does safety for trucking companies. Hmm. And... Uh, um, and well, he he's, does, the, he's the godfather of this whole movement. He, he is, <clears throat> absolutely. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I very much appreciate you guys coming. I, I just wish there was more people coming and, uh, you know, to kind of uh, spread the load out a little bit, you know. Yeah. But at any rate, so, uh, but this is talking about residents. And so you never want to be a resident, okay? That's the key, is I don't have a resident, I'm an inhabitant, okay? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's the first thing they want to know at the border. Where's your residence? You know, they're basically building a case against you. That's exactly what they're doing. <laughs> resident. One does not necessarily become a non-resident by absconding or absenting himself from his place on the boat. Did you know that? Think about that. That means it's voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in what you tell them. Really, it's always all in what you tell them. You know, my daughter was on a grand jury in Arizona for a year, I think, oh. and uh, and and she said that 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 people so many times, you know, the cops will come up and they'll say, "Are you smoking drugs?" and they'll say, "Yeah." <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, hello, <laughs> and 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 she said that they do it all the time, you know, and uh, and there's a YouTube video, you know, that's by this cop in Florida, and it says, when any encounter with the police, there's three rules I want you to follow. Shut the up. first rule is don't talk to the police. <laughs> the second rule is don't talk to the police. The third rule is don't talk to the police. Yeah. <laughs> You know, what's difficult about that? You know what I mean? And and there's even a law professor that gets up. There's a YouTube video about a law professor, and he says the same thing, is do not talk to the police. And uh, they're not your friends, you know? They have a function to perform. There's no doubt about it. And there's a thing called posse comitatus. Yeah. We're going to go through that. But uh, um, so, you know, everybody over the age of 15 is on the posse. Yeah. If you think about that, that's an awesome power, you know. If the sheriff would exercise his authority, I mean, there, there'd be no problems at all. They wouldn't need all this military. You know what I mean? Just round up, just get a posse. You know what I mean? And uh, Well, we should organize all the hunters. Well, there you go. Eh? <coughs> there you go. Because they have guns legally. So there's, so. so there's, you know, again, even, even with that, you know, uh, uh, if, they don't, if you don't have a gun, then uh, you're on the posse, then they ought to give you one. You know? Yep. I mean, you don't even see posses. You don't see grand juries forming in Canada. They haven't formed for 30 years. Yep. And, uh, and, and we need to start pushing for, for uh, uh, common law, you know? Anyways, so 
You become a resident by contract. That's how you become a resident. Residence, the fact of being officially present, okay? It's all statutory. It's a fictitious entity. The statutory present of an incumbent in a benefice. It might be correctly said that there's no such thing as a citizen of the United States. A citizen of any one of the states of the Union is held to being called a citizen of the United States, although technically and abstractly there is no such thing. So it's a fictitious entity. It's a SESTIC trust. I went to the Supreme Court, and, and uh, I've been there three times, and, and uh, the first time I went, that was what I told them. I was suing the IRS. The IRS was stealing my money when I was working at U.S. Airways. Yep. And so I was suing the IRS. And, and I went to the Supreme Court, and I, I, I put an affidavit in there, and it said, I don't have a Social Security number. I've never had a Social Security number. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> never heard a peep out of it. Because you don't have one. You don't have a Social Insurance number. It's that SESTIC Trust that has one. It's a fictitious entity. It's a fiction. It doesn't exist. You see what I'm saying? Well, you got to understand that. You know, That's why I don't have a driver's license. It's a fiction. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When you say you have one, well, you tell them you want to be a surety for that fictitious entity. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're doing. Mm. Whoops. There we go. Every taxpayer is a SESTIC trust, having sufficient interest in preventing the abuse of the trust to be recognized in the field of this court's prerogative jurisdiction. That's, a, that's a, 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 probably a Minnesota Northwest court case, Northwest Reports. Oh, no, it's probably actually, uh, well, it could be Minnesota, but it might be like Seattle or Washington or something like that. I don't know. Um, taxpayers are not state citizens. Okay? And, uh, and that's, so, so again, and we're, I've got a presentation on taxes. So we're going to cover this stuff more thoroughly. But, uh, again, do you know who you are? That's one of the things I tell people all the time. And, and you know who I got that from? I got it from Rice McLeod. <laughs> you know, that's what he always used to say. Do you know who you are? You don't know who you are. You're letting a bunch of bureaucrats tell you who you are, and you're letting them get away with it. Slater's protestation to the effect that he derives no benefit from the United States government have no bearing on his legal obligation to pay income tax. And that's true. If you're one of their slaves, then you pay the tribute. It's tribute. It's what it is. Unless the defendant can establish he is not a citizen of the United States, the IRS possesses authority to attempt to terminate his federal tax liability. Do you know who you are? We're going to talk about some court cases about race. Okay, we've talked a little bit about them so far. I always go through this right now because some of them are kind of inflammatory, quite frankly. Court cases about race used to talk about what was considered subjects before the 14th Amendment. Because of the so-called 14th Amendment, all subjects became U.S. citizens. So uh, this is Chisholm versus Georgia. Uh, and it's actually, I quoted this court case previously, but I had left this part of it out. It says, but they are sovereigns without subjects unless the African slaves among us may be so-called. So the, the, the slaves were considered subjects. Okay. Uh, no black or mulatto person or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against a white man. Did you know that? No federal citizen. The words Indian, Negro, black, and white are generic terms designating race. Therefore, Chinese and all other people not white are included in the prohibition from being witness against whites. That's true. Is that still true? Well, those, those acts have been repealed since uh, in those cases because uh, they, they did the 14th Amendment, right? So now the 14th Amendment is in place. Those cases are still there, but it's, they're moot because now it's just all U.S. citizens. See what I'm yeah. saying? So you can use, I'm using this argument to show that federal citizens don't have authority to give evidence against me. They don't have authority to even talk to me. I'm the king. See what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but the, the women are still not allowed to uh, uh, witness against uh, their husbands, right? <laughs> So, I don't know. Was that so? I guess case? there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. That's actually common law. Actually, yeah. now that I think about yeah. it, and and uh, and that's true. They're not. They're not. They're not. They're not forced to. Is what it is. They can't. Well, it's because because um, their stupid law, marriage, makes us one. So you cannot witness against yourself. 
Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, that's common law, actually. Yeah. You know, and they're joined together in marriage. Yeah, yeah that's right. So you become one. The uh, India sim of color is not an infallible test of competency of a witness under the Act, uh, excluding blacks, mulattoes, Indians, and, test and from testifying for or against white persons. Uh, in a criminal action against a white person, a black or mulatto person, though the injured party cannot under the statute be a witness against the white against the defendant. Uh, the words in favor of or against a white person in the act prohibiting persons of one half or more Indian blood or Mongolian or Chinese from giving evidence refer to the defendant alone in a criminal action. So again, it's talking about how people of different races before the 14th Amendment, before the Civil War, uh, were subjects, okay, and they didn't have any rights. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States does not conflict with the power of the legislature in the exercise of its discretion to exclude Chinamen from the right to testify in state courts. <laughs> Crimes Act, as amended in 1863, provided that no Indian, Mongolian, or Chinese shall be permitted to give evidence in the courts of the state in favor of or against a white man is not in conflict with the Constitutional Amendment 14, which provides that persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens, that no state shall make any law abrogating the privileges <coughs> or immunities of the citizens, nor deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, deny to any within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws, since the restriction of such amendment imposed on states relate to substantial personal rights of liberty, property, etc., and do not extend to mere rules of evidence. <laughs> okay. But so again, it talks about the fact that if you're not white in the states, then uh, then you're a subject, okay? And so what happened is, if you think about it, uh, uh, at the revolution, the whites, all the whites were sovereigns, and everybody else was a subject, and uh, and and then they went and uh, orchestrated a civil war, and so then they could make whites into, U or I should say, all the subjects <clears throat> into U.S. citizens, and anybody that's white gets to volunteer for it. And, uh, and then over the years, I mean, everybody volunteered for it. See what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And, uh, uh, but again, uh, under common law, you have to understand that under common law, none of that applies. It's all in the matrix, basically. But it's, so it's talking about the difference that these are all subjects, okay? That's, that's, those were all subjects. The evidence of a Chinaman cannot be admitted to prove white man guilty of manslaughter. Again, that's uh, anybody that's uh, subject. The right of trial by jury in civil cases guaranteed by the Seventh Amendment, the right to bear arms guaranteed by the Second Amendment, have been distinctly held not to be privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, guaranteed by the Fourteenth Amendment. And in effect, the same decision is made in respect to the guarantee against prosecution, except by indictment of a grand jury contained in the Fifth Amendment, and in respect of the right to be confronted with witnesses contained in the Sixth Amendment. So, again, um, federal citizens do not have access to these common law rights. And, and, um, and so that's what they're doing here. Okay, they're converting everybody to federal citizens, and, and unless you bring up the issue, it'll continue. Okay. And, and I'm bringing up that issue. I am railing on them big time. And, uh, um, you know, because there's no indictment. You know, they charge me under, uh, under uh, the, the Criminal Code of Canada that says that this is an indictable offense. Well, there's no indictment. And a ruling, a probable cause by a judge is not an indictment. And so... Uh, uh, I, I have a right to an indictment. Otherwise, you guys can't proceed. You know, you need to convene a grand jury. And furthermore, you assaulted me. You know, and it just goes on and on. Huh. So, uh, the technical niceties of the common law are not regarded. A jury does not figure ordinarily at the trial of an admiralty suit. The verdict of the jury merely advisory. It may be disregarded by the court. You know, there's people in the states that get put in jail because they're on a jury and they refuse to vote to do what the court tells them to do, so they put them in jail. I don't know if that happens in Canada. I think that, uh, <clears throat> but but all of the courts in Canada are clearly admiralty. Uh, you know, at common law, a jury does not get instructions. At common law, they don't withhold evidence from the jury. The jury sees everything. Um, at common law, you know, the jury is God in the courtroom. 
and uh, we'll talk about that one. Uh, the rules of practice may be altered whenever found to be inconvenient. Oh, yeah, right. Inconvenient or likely to embarrass the business of the court. In other words, <laughs> well, we don't want to do that disclosure thing because, uh, you know, that'll, dis that'll embarrass the business. You know, in other words, we're going to railroad this guy. You see what I'm saying? That's exactly what they're doing. Um, uh, a court of admiralty acts upon equitable principles, okay, so it's all equity. Uh, a libel of information, that's how they proceed, okay, a libel, it's called a libel. A libel of information, and that's what they filed against me in this court is an information, okay? That's a libel, that's a libel of information. And so it's admiralty proceeding by definition does not require all the technical pre uh, precision of an indictment at common law. If the allegations describe the offense, it is, it is all that is necessary. And if it is founded upon a statute, it is sufficient that it pursues the words of the statute. The Congress shall have power to dis uh, uh, dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or the property belonging to the United States. Hey, Glenn, yeah. just before you go on on that last one, uh, that information has to be provided by a man. Yeah. When, when they lay in information, uh -huh. it has to be provided by a man. Because the fiction and can't break. So a photo uh, radar is not a lawful information. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, because in Black's Law and everywhere when you look up the information, what it is, it has to be laid by a man. But if you because there has to be someone there to state the facts. Right. Right. Okay. Where's the witnesses? Yeah. There is no witness with a camera. A camera can't be a witness. That's, That's right. But I recently video. found out that the de one of the in, in their definitions the word man is actually a fiction. Yeah? Yes. So you yeah. have to know what the definition of man is. Well it's <coughs> not a living soul. But under under Magna Carta, it says that um, that no officer of the government, and this is another reason that a, a, like a speeding ticket or anything where a cop stops you on the road is 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 the way you can defeat it, because no officer of the government can do anything to you on his word alone. Okay, <laughs> they gotta have witnesses, and so that's what you need to. I know people in the states that that beat stuff all the time, traffic tickets and stuff like that, because they'll just go in and they'll say, "Where's the witnesses?" And, and he can't do it by on his word alone. Oh. And the court, and they'll dismiss the case. And so, um, the Bible says on the laws two Does that apply in Canada as well? Have you, have you oh, heard of, of any cases? Of course, it's Magna Carta. Yeah. Well, I don't, ha I don't have any cases. Like a, I've but, never uh, heard of but that's anybody Magna Carta. using that successfully. That's Magna Carta. Yeah. Where's the witnesses? Right. Sure. I know a guy in BC that uh, I, I think it was a traffic offense. He was the First Nations, but he went into court, and he said, uh, he's, they asked, they said, are you, you know, the straw man? And he said, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have if you first answer one question for me. And the judge says, okay, what is it? And he says, is this a de facto court? And the judge said, get him out of here. <laughs> Case got dismissed, because yeah. they're all de facto. Absolutely. Um, the Congress shall have power. Okay, we read this already. It's all, uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're literally their property. You're a slave. There have always been two classes of citizens. The U.S. Constitution talks about it. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileged immunities of citizens in the several states. Okay? The each state and several states. That's several states. Is a federal constitution is a federal government. Each state is each state. So that's two classes of citizens, uh, state citizens and federal citizens. Um, but the stranger that dwelleth among you shall be unto you as one born among you. Okay, stranger and those born in the land. Thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That's how they enslaved the children of Israel. They're doing exactly the same thing again. The more things change, the more they stay the same. They're doing exactly the same thing that they had used to enslave the children of Israel. That's exactly what's going on. Love you therefore a stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. The rights of sovereignty, there's even court cases that use these common law biblical terms. The rights of sovereignty extend to all persons or things not privileged. Okay? Not privileged that are within the territory. They extend to all strangers, resident, okay, 
two words, resident and strangers. Not only to those who are naturalized or those who are domiciled uh, and therein taken up their abode with the intention of permanent residence, but also to those residents as transitory, all strangers under the protection of the sovereign while they're within the territory own a temporary allegiance in return for that protection. So again, they're talking about strangers and, and that's, those, that's the people who weren't born there, right? That's actually the biblical terminologies. And they're talking about those two classes. They're talking about um, um, the residents, right? And the ones that are naturalized and the one that are permanent residents, right? So that's that Vettel, remember? Taken from that the Law of Nations. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the resident and, uh, and how a citizen is one that's a permanent resident. See, and it passes on to their children. Um, Strangers have social security or social insurance numbers. Um, thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayst lend upon usury. So, a foreigner. So when you get, in the States, they, they, they will not give you a credit card unless you produce a social security number. You will not get it. I've tried, believe me, I've filed criminal complaints and all sorts of stuff against them. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you won't get it unless prepaid, you prepaid visa. That's what you get. Yeah, well, even those nowadays you, you can't get those in Canada. No, no, yeah, you can. Bank, yeah. I just yeah. got one. Did yeah. you? No social insurance. No kidding. Uh, Bank of Montreal, go on their website and prepaid credit card, and I just have one, and my credit is racked, uh -huh. and uh, no problem. Huh. With my, well, like, well, my straw man's name on it. Right. Yeah. Does it show that it's prepaid? What? Say anything about prepaid on it? It, it looks like just a, any regular visa. Is that right? Yeah, and you go yeah. into uh, Bank of Montreal. Actually, you can load it. How it, I called in, and they said, uh, so what you do is you set it up on your internet banking as a bill, and you just put Load like, it from your bank account? Yeah, $500, oh, yeah. and then it'll, so now you have a $500 credit limit on there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's really neat. So it's as much as you want to put on it, too. Mm -hmm. Well, you can put it, it allows $10, anybody $10, to have a credit card. Right. Anybody. Right. Straw yeah. man or not. Well, credit cards are very useful. Like if you want to buy an airline ticket or rent a hotel yes. room or something like that, they're real, I mean, you go pay cash and it's a hassle. Well, I was using the virtual credit cards, the Entro Pay, uh -huh. but, but a lot of places it was such a hassle. Like, I need a plastic physical card. And right. I'm like, well, I don't have one. So I, then I found out about this Bank of Montreal. So Free Bank of Montreal card. is the only one that you know of that doesn't In Canada, have? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the States. So, so the application is like three fields, and there's nothing about any kind of social insurance. Right thing. on. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going to have to, maybe I'll have to open up a Bank of Montreal account. But uh, anyways, the bankster thieves will not loan money unless you can prove you're a resident. Um, and uh, is this one here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good prepaid? Good prepaid? Oh, it says prepaid, though. It says on a prepaid. But it still doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. No, I was just curious. In the States, they say... Um, you can get it from Money Mart. What's important is it's got the name on it. Because then, you know, then it matches. That's your true. Figure. That's true. But yeah. uh, to rent a car, for example, if it says prepaid on it, they're not. They don't like that. I mean, they, it's not that they won't take it, but they'll treat it like cash. You know, it's different than. I don't know. I've yeah, be because because it's not backed by those. They see, they see right. Visa. They ran through. It says approved, and they move on with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think I think the prepaid card is limited liability. That's why. Yeah, it could be. Well, yeah. You're only liable for the amount that's prepaid. Right. You're not liable for any debt. Right. Um, in summary, a U.S. citizen does not have access to the first eight amendments against the powers of the federal government, which are common law rights. Uh, there's no trial to a right to a trial by jury. There's no right to keep and bear arms. There's no right to face your accuser. There's no right to give evidence uh, uh, against state citizens. There's no right to common law indictment. Uh, mandatory military service, mandatory taxes, may vote, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. You know, I mean, you think about it. <laughs> you can be a national without being a citizen. Uh, citizenship is part of a political community. This is actually the U.S. passport application, and it talks about uh, where the box is. It says, uh, I'm a citizen or non-citizen national. 
See? So you can be a non-citizen national. And that's, that's what you want to be. Hmm. Uh, and it talks about it in the application form. Uh, uh, it talks about non-citizen nationals. It is, however, true in all common law countries and has always and consistently been held that the wife and minor children take the nationality of the husband and father. That is common law doctrine. Okay? So that is fundamental. And that's why, again, if your wife doesn't have to testify against you, um, because it, it, you become one, right? Mm -hmm. Common law. They recognize common law. If you think about it, and this is one of the things I haven't done yet, but uh, the hierarchy is you have common law up here. And all these other types of law are really subsets of common law. And uh, like under common law, you have the right to make contracts, right? And so based on that right to make contracts comes law merchant, which is private law and basically supersedes common law in many ways. But you can still, even under law merchant, you can reserve your rights under common law. You see what I'm saying? By put, without prejudice. And when you sign stuff. You see what I'm saying? And uh, 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 so, so it's all, all of it's subset of common law. And, 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 but what you need to do is get yourself out of that stuff, back to common law. The problem is that, and we're going to talk about this more, is that common law is very severe. You know, If you, for example, remember I said that uh, at common law, stop signs a yield sign. And